Uh, what a pleasure to welcome you to the Vancouver School of Theology for our special lecture this evening. I'm Richard Topping, and I'm the principal of the school. Uh, we just love to welcome our friends and new friends to campus. Our students and faculty are ready, and they're here tonight to answer any inquiry you might have about a program at the Vancouver School of Theology, and uh, we'd be happy to give you some literature about it. Uh, emergency exits are located along this side of the auditorium and then out through the entrance that you came in, in through, and the, the washrooms are just outside the back door. Uh, we acknowledge with respect that we meet on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, that is the people of the river grass. And we pray that we might live more deeply into truth and reconciliation with indigenous peoples until that day when God reconciles all peoples and all things in Christ. I want to thank this evening Dr. Ashley Moyes and Dr. David Robinson, both research associates here at the Vancouver School of Theology for their work in organizing the visit of Professor Coakley to Vancouver. Uh, tonight, it's going to be uh, Professor Biasi's happy responsibility to introduce our visiting scholar. I, I just want to say before he does that, I'm a fan and that Professor Coakley, your theological work has helped me, it's changed my mind, it's changed the minds of students I teach, and it's turned our minds and our affections and our imagination uh, toward God and contemplation. It's just terrific that Professor Coakley is here this evening. Uh, just before uh, I ask Dr. Biasi to come forward and introduce our speaker, uh, let's to join together in a prayer of invocation of the Holy Spirit. And this is a prayer written by Thomas Aquinas, and it's especially for students. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, divine creator, the true source of light and the fountain of wisdom. Pour forth your brilliance upon our intellects. Dissipate the darkness which covers us. Grant us penetrating minds to understand, retentive memories, method and ease in learning, the lucidity to comprehend and abundant grace in expressing ourselves. Guide the beginning of our work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This we ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true human, living and reigning with you and the Father forever and ever. Amen. teacher of mine said that most theologians and most theological institutions either talk about God or talk about the world. Now, if you're a student of VST, you know this is not just a mistake, it's a calamity, because the only God we have will not be God without us. Sarah Coakley's work shows how deeply that's true. She's one of the leading theological voices on the planet. I say that by virtue of her giving the Gifford Lectures in 2012. Christian Century Magazine calling her the essential theologian. One might say that's actually the Holy Spirit, but right. Um, and her four honorary doctorate degrees, including one from St. Mike's in Toronto. But I want to tell you something about her and prayer. Early in her theological career, she did what she calls field work on the Trinity. And she talked to Pentecostal believers about the Holy Spirit and their experience of prayer. And that went into forming her own doctrine of the Spirit. Um, her own experience of prayer is one that includes being in a prayer group with two other theologians you may have heard of as an undergraduate, David Ford and Rowan Williams. It's time well spent. I interviewed her once about one of her mentors, and she described that one as a person who is magnetized, electrified by prayer. And she said, you never forget a person like that. And I think that's why I find you unforgettable, Sarah Coakley. Our students have been looking forward to hearing from you, not for weeks, but for months. Thank you for being here. Well, what a delight to be here. And let me express my sincere thanks to, um, to uh, Richard Topping and, and Jason Biasi for those introductory remarks and for the faculty and senior members of the school. Um, and for their gracious introduction. Um, I do look forward to hearing what you have to think about what I'm going to say and for further interactions with you while I'm staying here. Now, this is a difficult lecture, and I'm sure you'd rather be somewhere else, like in a pub, having a, a beer on Friday night, so I take it as a very high honor that you've even come. 
Um, but this is complicated, but a lot hangs on it. And the handout, I think, will help you. So I'm going to start by saying what I'm going to do. And at the end, I'll tell you what I have done. And if you zone out at some point in between, um, I'll be able to bring you back with a start at the end. The central thesis of my lecture this evening is a bold one. And I want to state it in its starkest form at the outset, because I shall then spend much of the rest of the time evidencing, refining, and nuancing it, whilst also, in closing, considering its potential contemporary, spiritual, and churchly significance. What I want to argue centrally is that the divisive, long-standing dispute between so-called Eastern and Western Christendom over the status and place of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity, which is often called the filioque problem about the procession of the Spirit. Does the Spirit proceed from the Father or from the Father and the Son, filioque? which was interpolated into the Nicene Creed in the West, in the medieval period. I want to say that that long-standing dispute, which really even now is not solved ecumenically, might never have arisen in the form it did had the Spirit's radical divine equality with the Father and the Son not already been implicitly compromised by the historic conciliar treatment of the Holy Spirit precisely as third in processional order. Right, this is a radical thing because we have these orthodox creeds in which the Holy Spirit is talked about third. And the problem is, does that already create a problem? In other words, despite the church's emphatic insistence from the later fourth century that the Holy Spirit was absolutely equal in divinity with the Father and Son, sharing all divine characteristics with them, the contingencies of the way in which the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity had been arrived at in conciliar disputes from, the from Nicaea through to Constantinople, plus what I call the linear structure of the thinking that accompanied this, respect, this reflection, from Father to Son and only then to the Holy Spirit, I think subliminally continued to fashion the thinking of the Spirit as third in at least a logical, if not ontological, hierarchy. And this tendency was indeed already written deeply into major strands of the biblical testimony. The Johannine, for instance, where the prologue starts with the relationship between the Father and Son, and only later do we hear about the Spirit. And the Book of Acts, where it's not until Jesus goes away that we have the spirit that you know, takes us into the era of the church. And that same ordering was in, ensconced in the early liturgies, especially the early Greek lit liturgies of the Eucharist and to, into much pre-early um, fourth century theology. One may therefore speculative place the origins of the eventual Western filioque addition to the Nicene Creed Origins which, as most scholars now agree, were theologically as much Eastern as they were Western, as a certain secondary attempt to correct and palliate this fundamental problem, rather than a starker acknowledgement of a deeper issue to be addressed. Now, this first plank in my argument admittedly involves a rather odd form of counterfactual historical thinking. We cannot now turn back the pages of history, and nor am I suggesting that we should do so. The historic creeds of Nicaea and Constantinople must stand. Indeed, it was the insertion of the filioque by the West into the latter without the mandating of another ecumenical council that has arguably caused more trouble than the theological content encoded in it. That's what really annoyed the East, that the West went ahead and popped this into a creed without having an ecumenical council to discuss it. So it remains our job as theologians to expound these historic creeds with as much critical and spiritual insight from the various traditions of the churches as we can muster, including from the Protestant traditions of reflection on the Trinity, of course, to which I shall occasionally advert tonight. And indeed, I am by no means the first person to suggest this particular critique of the conciliar trin Trinitarian history of the early centuries however contentious it may still remain. People as diverse as Thomas Wynandy 
um, a highly um, conservative uh, Catholic theologian, um, and on the other end of the spectrum, Mick Habits from the Pentecostal angle. Both are representatives of people who have seen this problem and would like to do something about it, even now. So what is perhaps more innovative in what I have to say, I trust, and where most of my energy will be taken up tonight, is in my attempt to sketch out an alternative approach to the place of the Spirit in the Trinity, which would not fall prey to the veiled hierarchy problems still encoded, as I see it, even in the historic conciliar traditions. And even to some degree, because it doesn't correct it enough, in the later filioque debates. For even when the notion of the filioque was added to the idea of the Spirit's procession from the Father, whether as an actual insertion into the creed, as in the later West, or in more impromptu earlier thinkers, including some Eastern ones, such as Cyril of Alexandria, there remained an unspoken question about whether the very notion of fatherhood in the Trinity as sole source and cause in the Trinity implicitly continue to foster an unintended evocation of subordination. If everything leads back to the Father, doesn't that suggest that the Father has, as it were, not just logical priority, but some kind of ontological priority? Thus, in what follows, I seek to lay bare what I see as a minority tradition of thinking about and responding to the Holy Spirit in the Trinity, which also has its roots in biblical witness and which certain exponents in both East and West have remarkably manifested in a parallel fashion and for the most part without any critical reposts to the official creedal traditions on their part. Thereby, they have found their way into a rendition of the Trinity that I believe can purify it from certain implicit theological dangers of encoded hierarchicalism, even as they also hold it to account in terms of its own stated intentions, the radical equality of the persons. So we might call this a kind of imminent critique of conciliar Trinitarianism within this minority tradition I'm going to sketch. It takes the fundamental principle of the Nicene tradition that the spirit is absolutely of one substance, equal with father and son, and then creatively wields it, deeply attending to the propulsion of the spirit. And what we shall find is that this, what I call purgative pneumatological tradition, which springs up spontaneously from time to time in both East and West, often comes from quarters with interesting reforming theological characteristics in other ways, certain tendencies to a particular sort of social location on the edge, certain fascinations with the reform of ecclesiastical power, and certain insights into the fundamental nature of the participative human person in God, especially as this participation relates to deepest human erotic needs and their resolution. This is really an interesting package. So there's a certain social and political locatedness to this minority tradition, this pneumatologically infused way of thinking about the Trinity, which I call ascetic or mystical, which I wish to explore, which is always deeply founded in disciplined prayer and contemplation. And it's always unafraid to tackle difficult issues of divine and human desire. You may begin then to see why this material could be of continuing contemporary interest to us, even if we don't care very much about speculation about the inner life of the Trinity, which you should care about, of course. <laughs> and it's not just something arcane um, for theological scholars who have nothing else to do, and for ecumenists who are still struggling away on the cold face, trying to bring East and West together. Right, that's what I'm going to try and do with you. Are you ready? So I've so far given you my bold generic thesis by way of introduction. But before I turn to present my evidences for your perusal, I also need to name a cluster of methodological caveats. Theologians always do this, don't they? in relation to some pressing contemporary debates in Trinitarian theology, if only to head off some potential misunderstandings of my position. 
because this arena is fraught with theological danger. Let me name some dangers. First, in presenting these witnesses from the tradition that I'm going to talk about to a particular spirit-inflected understanding of the Trinity, I am deliberately refusing the disjunctive epistemological view, common since Kant and Schleiermacher, that the inner life of the Trinitarian God, the so-called immanent or ontological Trinity in our lingo, is somehow unavailable to us, completely off limits epistemologically, while only the so-called economic trinity, known through revelation and our participation in the economy of salvation, is open for theological inspection. The reason I'm going to refuse this challenge, though I think you wouldn't have come tonight if you absolutely didn't want to hear about the inner life of the trinity, but the reason I'm going to refuse this challenge will become more obvious in the telling of my evidences. What is witnessed here is a form of knowing God which is simultaneously revelatory and at the same time mysterious, compelling in its very mysteriousness. And this is a paradoxical category of epistemic response, simply refused, of course, by a modern Kantian epistemological turn. God is in the realm of nescience there, not mysterious revelation. It can only arise, I submit, through a clear understanding of God's utter transcendence as creator, evidence through the unique epistemic oddity of courting intimacy with the divine in prayer. As a young scholar called Jason Smith puts it in a recent article, illuminatingly comparing the Trinitarian strategies of Schleiermacher on the one hand and Rowan Williams on the other, I quote, Whereas for Schleiermacher, there is nothing about the Christian life that could compel one to say anything about God's inner trinity. For Williams, in complete contrast, it is impossible even to start out on the adventure of redemption without, quote, an invitation into the inner divine life in all its simultaneous transcendent mystery and illumination. Such as we shall see is also the insight of the witnesses we shall summon in what follows. So that's one problem that often comes up. However, in refusing the disjunction of imminent and economic trinities in relation to my project, I am also not simply reducing the former, the imminent, to the latter. To say with Karl Rahner in his famous slogan that the economic trinity is the imminent trinity is to declare a point of substantial identity which had appeared threatened in some classic speculative scholastic treatments. The speculation about the inner life of God seemed to get dislocated from the talk about God in his missions. But that doesn't mean that one doesn't need a remaining distinction, at least, between the action and life of God in history and God's eternal nature. Those who resist even this distinction arrive at a position such that God could only realize God's only na own nature within the contingencies of history. None of the voices to which I am going to appeal assume that latter position, a distinctively novel and Hegelian or post-Hegelian option within modern theology, where God can only find out who God is in, as it were, sending uh, revelatory messages to the human. Rather, the implicit claim of the authors I shall draw upon seems to be that the Holy Spirit's profound incorporation of them participatorily into the life of God takes them precisely to this mysterious intersection of the timed and the timeless in what we may call the incarnational space thereby opened up. A third issue is also related methodologically. It has sometimes been assumed in the modern period that the Kantian nescience problem in relation to the divine could be got around by appeals to a special direct mystical consciousness that somehow circumvents it. On this view, which owes much to William James and the psychologizing of religious states, mystical experience can become a criterion of theological truth with a certain supposed self-authenticating force to be set in contrast with the complex contrapuntal authorities of scripture, tradition, and reason. Something of this instinct informs Anne Hunt's study on your list, The Trinity, Insights from the Mystics, a volume which I've otherwise found most illuminating for my current task. 
But she writes that the exploration of mystic consciousness, her term, is a way of avoiding philosophical issues in relation to the Trinity and of probing to an unmediated experience of it. I want to clarify that this is not the task as I perceive it tonight. For not only am I dubious about the existence of something to be generalized as a universal mystic consciousness, I am also resistant to the idea that any of the exponents on whom I shall be calling avoided, whether or not they were professionally trained theologians to speak anachronistically, the hard graft of discerning the relation of scriptural authority, complex vying theological traditions, and the critical negotiation of these. To put it pointedly, it is the disciplined activity and practice of prayer and contemplation in creative interaction with these other hermeneutical tasks, which seems to produce the pneumatological and trinitarian insights I'm seeking to explore. Not some unmediated experience of the Trinity which can be strained out of the mix and, dis and declared to be mystic in some mysterious sense. A final caveat is one that comes with the contemporary feminist territory, which I also explore critically as a systematician and a philosopher of religion. Here it has become fashionable in the latter part of the 20th century, as searingly critiqued most recently in Lynn Tonstadt's book, God and Difference, for theologians as diverse as Hans Urs von Balthasar on the one hand, or the feminist Catholic Elizabeth Johnson on the other, to read certain gendered messages into the very life of the Trinity, and thereby to detect a form of social program for our erotic or political lives as somehow inscribed into the life of the Godhead. I therefore wish to indicate here at the outset and against Lynn Tonstadt's very strange misreading of my own work on this score that this is not my ambition in relation to this material. For as we shall see, if there is a general lesson that emerges from their witness in relation to gender as we now call it, it is that desire, the more significant category for the purposes of a number of these writers, belongs properly and first to God as a means of outreach to us, who by definition lies beyond all human categorizations of gender. It is thus through the purification of human desire in the divine Trinitarian desire in prayer and worship that such human categorizations of gender come to be transfigured and changed. In other words, as I have put it elsewhere in the first volume of my systematics, Desire is more fundamental than gender, and the desiring Trinitarian God ultimately ambushes all attempts to fix and constrain a secular binary of gender in worldly terms. But that's to anticipate the end of the story I'm now going to unfold, and one in which a curious convergence of insights emerges most fascinatingly in Eastern and Western forms between the early medieval period and the 16th century. All right, ground clearing, finished. Got that? All clear about that? <laughs> Heading off all these dangers. So to tell this story in the highly selective form that is manageable within one hour's lecture, I must return first to that point in the history of formal creedal-based patristic Trinitarianism when East and West, so-called, it's really just a shorthand for Greek and Latin speakers, supposedly started to diverge. For that presumed divergence is part of the story I want to question. Recall, what we are looking for here are signs of a relatively neglected tradition of Trinitarian thought, deeply inflected by a primary engagement in prayer with the Spirit, and which, in turn, destabilizes the presumption when one moves to ontological specula speculation about the Godhead that what is established first and normatively is the perfect relation between father and son, only adding the spirit afterwards. Where and when does this alternative vision challenge the linear or sequential thinking about the Godhead that had seemed so necessary a part of the early public defense of fourth century orthodoxy? 
So now we get into section two, participative Trinitarianism in patristic and medieval tradition, East and West. Now, this is an account I have told in its earlier stages at some arduous length in the first volume of my systematics, God, Sexuality, and the Self. And I don't want to recapitulate my argument there, but rather to take it several steps forward in the body of this lecture. However, what I do need to reiterate from that book is the key scriptural basis for this alternative pneumatological vision of the Trinity whose heritage I seek now to trace further in its reception. The crucial hinge is the account given by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, 14 to 30. For in it, Paul underscores what we may call, and what my friend Eugene Rogers has also called it in his creative monograph, After the Spirit, what, he, what, what we both call the impossibility of prayer. That is, the authentic helplessness that Paul witnesses to in our need to abandon ourselves first to the Spirit, even to know rightly what to ask for, as he puts it, and so come into our own as children of God. Prayer is, on this vision, the graced entry point through the Spirit into the conversation that is already and always going on between the ultimate source in the Godhead, Abba, as Paul names it here, following Jesus' own term, and the spirit who engenders that conversation in us. Prayer, in other words, is not our monologue to a distant patriarch, the Father, but the joining of a conversation which already destabilizes that sort of idolatrous thought experiment about fatherhood from the start. To enter into that ongoing divine dialectical conversation in which God the Spirit answers to God the Father, Abba, in a ceaseless circle of gift and response, is to be constrained, therefore, into what we may call the authentic space of Jesus, the incarnational embodied space of physical dying and rising, of suffering and coming into glory, into which, according to Romans 8, the whole created and cosmic realm is already also being progressively drawn. Significantly, Paul names this the realm of eager longing, another way of talking about desire, of a kind of primordial desire set on its rightful, non-idolatrous goal of full adoption as children of God, inheritors of the glorious liberty for which God ultimately intends us. Now, this Pauline biblical model, then, despite all its unfinished nature as a merely, as it were, preparatory intimation of later developed Trinitarian orthodoxy, sits somewhat uncomfortably alongside the normative creedal, creedal Trinitarianism, which grew out of a primary focus on the father-son relationship, as in the prologue to the Gospel of John, which by the third century, under the influence of Origen and other commentators, had begun to have a certain theological preeminence in the life of the church. According to this other and increasingly dominant model in the early debates, one which also founded, as I've mentioned, the order of the church year, according to the logic of the Book of Acts, the unique and perfect relationship of father and son is that established order out of which the life of the spirit and the church is subsequently created. According to John, as you recall, the son goes away after the resurrection in order that the spirit may come as his substitute and continuator. On this linear or sequential account, the spirit is always third and, in a sense, an understudy or replacement to that which is already established in the Son. Yet this tradition, in turn, sits oddly, you might say, with the equally biblical insistence that in the order of the economy, the Son cannot be incarnate in the first place without the overshadowing of the spirit, as we see in Luke chapter 1 nor can he be designated the beloved son at baptism without the descent of the dove. That's Mark 1 and parallels. And that's why von Balthasar, commenting incisively on this problem, calls it the theological inversion from the primary spirit in the economy to its third place in the ontology or speculation. In other words, and as many others have commented, the biblical witness presents us with no consistent account of the taxis or ordering of the divine persons 
for later Trinitarian discussion. And the political contingency of the original Arian crisis in the early fourth century as one that focused not on the spirit at all, but simply on the son's particular status vis-a-vis -vis the father, led perhaps inevitably to an immediate solution, the creed of Nicaea, that barely mentioned the spirit. It just says, and in the spirit at the end. <laughs> While insisting on the homoousian status of the son alone, alongside the father. The sequential die, you might say, was therefore already cast. Only in the crucial later fourth century was the hypostatic identity and divine full status of the spirit also urged and defended. Now, what is really at stake here then, theologically and politically? A lot, as subsequent church history and theological debate would manifest. We meet what I've called the linear or sequential model once more in full flood as the Cappadocian fathers in the late fourth century use it to defend the coherence of the idea of a God who is simultaneously one in substance, usia, and three in persons, hypostasize. For Basil of Caesarea and his treatise on the Holy Spirit, and especially at the crucial text 923 therein, this order is clearly a matter of assent to the Father, a kind of journey with Neoplatonic evocation still, in which the spirit first grasps one and, and takes one up to the level of the sun, whence one begins to be dazzled afresh by the unspeakable mystery of the father. Gregory of Nyssa also seemingly defends this sequential approach implicitly in various writings following on from his brother Basil, albeit with some modifications. The Trinity, he writes in a letter previously attributed to Basil, yet clearly stylistically Gregory's, that's Epistle 38, is like a chain that you pull at one end as the different elements present themselves in turn from the spirit back up to the father. And Gregory's emphasis on the intrinsic mystery of the Godhead in his anti-Eunomian writings does not as such destabilize this linear conviction. Now, it is, however, in Gregory's late commentary, his last great work on the, on the commentary, his commentary on the Song of Songs, that another and contrapuntal voice emerges in Gregory. And I've written at some length on this in an article recently published, which is on your handout. Freed up from the burden of insistent apologetic and philosophical duty, and discoursing with equally free allegorical imagination on the text of the song, and its meaning for the human hope of supreme divine incorporative intimacy. Gregory startles us suddenly in homilies 15 with the suggestion of a double procession of the spirit. The spirit now is the bond of glory, as he puts it. That is, the very means of unity between father and son, which is acknowledged even as it spills over into the disciples and from there to the church at large. Gregory makes this assertion, moreover, in the context of a teaching on the song which insists on progressive spiritual maturity in prayer and scriptural meditation as the authentic marks of mature discipleship. This is a different genre. He's not defending the doctrine of the Trinity from incoherence philosophically, which is apologetic duty. Now he's saying to his intimate followers, do you really want to have union with God? This is now how you have to think about the Trinity, and it's strikingly different. In other words, to receive the Holy Spirit in this way, between the persons of Father and Son, is to leave immaturity behind at last, to grasp what Gregory actually calls the true philosophic reasonings, and what he means by that is not Apologetics, what he means by true philosophy, is an allegorical approach to the Bible in which reflection on the Song of Songs, as in the tradition of the rabbis, is the highest way of thinking about our union with God. And with that, to acknowledge the ways in which Christian selfhood finally comes to intensify its ecstatic desire for God rather than to set desire aside. I quote, until that time when... All, since all have become one in desiring the same goal and there is no vice left in any, God may become all in all persons. 
He hasn't lost his sense of the utter transcendence of God, but what he's saying is that there is a way to mature into the faith in which by finding ourselves in that ecstatic life in which the Spirit draws us into the relationship between Father and Son, that's the place where we really understand what the inner life of God is. It seems then that in Gregory's oeuvre, there are at least two genres for dealing with problems of Trinitarian expression. One is apologetic and focused primarily on philosophical coherence, and it tends to the linear. The other, more significant ultimately spiritually for Gregory, is rooted in allegorical scriptural meditation and contemplation and undertaken for the training of mature Christian desire, specifically. Desire propelled pneumatologically to its ultimate blending or mixing, his word, with Christ and his body, the church. Through sharing in the place the spirit holds between father and son, the place of doxa. Now, the Greeks hate it when you tell them about this <laughs> because they are absolutely devoted to the idea that this linear model is theirs, it's Eastern, it's different from the West, it's got no nasty filioque. And then you say, you're great Gregory of Nyssa. What about him? Do we find anything similar in the West at approximately the same time? Not exactly, but there are certain intimations even in Augustine. I am, of course, not now alone in insisting that Augustine's Trinitarianism forged not long after Gregory's, of course, and with direct influences from the East via Ambrose, though there's no evidence that he knew Gregory of Nyssa, had identical what Lewis Ayres calls pro-Nicene instincts to the East, despite its use of the celebrated psychological analogies, which later came to be thought of as distinctively Western. But in the course of his disquisition on these analogies, Augustine already sketches more than once his own double procession of the spirit, even though he reminds us that this procession remains principally, principaliter, from the father. What is less often commented upon even now is his dramatic reversal of tone about all this at the very end of the De Trinitate in book 15, when all of a sudden his emphatic, apophatic instincts shine through afresh. He suddenly tells us, that none of those psychological analogies that he rehearsed earlier are any good at all. They won't do justice to the subject in hand. Rather, what is central, he now says, is the primary and overflowing gift, the donum of love in the Holy Spirit, an incorporative and ecstatic flow of charity poured forth into our hearts to mirror the reality of the divine and transform us into the image, but also to dazzle and mystify us as wonderfully ineffable or ineffably wonderful, as he puts it. Again, in closing, he reiterates his conviction that what this spiritual insight implies is a processional flow of the spirit from both father and son. In short, although their exegetical strategies and analogies, of course, differ, Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine are aligned at the end of their lives in their witness to a spirit-leading, ecstatic, and participative account of the conforming of the human to the true image of the Trinitarian God in us. At this point, their more speculative or apologetic techniques seem to retire into the background, and a rather different discourse or genre comes to dominate, one primarily infused with pneumatological participative energy. Here is already the birth of what was to be called the indwelling trinity motif of later Western mystical theologians of the medieval period. And it has, as we have noted, implied speculative implications for the relational processional life of God in God's self, though it's not clear at the time. In many ways, then, we may see what I am calling the minority Trinitarian materials now to be discussed in their respective traditions in East and West as certain extensions or intensifications of these key, albeit somewhat fleeting, moments of insight in Nissen and Augustine, although we must watch for important elements of variation on their themes. Moreover, Dionysius the Areopagite, your friend and mine, <laughs> fifth century mystery figure, was to supply in the late fifth century, a crucial metaphysical undergirding to the idea of such a divine ecstatic flow 
as Augustine describes, even though he did not himself explicitly frame it in Trinitarian terms. For him, desire itself becomes a divine ontological force inherent in God's life, an ecstatic capacity of God to go out and return, always carried outside of himself whilst always remaining within himself. So the idea that desire belongs primarily to God and is a metaphysical way of talking about God as ecstatic and returning, we get from Dionysius, even though you could say there's already intimations of that in both Nissen and Augustine. And the philosophical, philosophical overtones here are, of course, actually Neoplatonic, specifically rem reminiscent of Proclus. But Dionysius makes the case that they are entirely congruent with the themes in Paul he wishes to highlight. He's pretending to be the first convert of Paul in, um, in Athens. And so he looks for themes in um, Paul's writings and in the story of Paul's um, speech on the Areopagite Hill for uh, things that will defend the theology that he's presenting. Paul, he says, was a great lover and beside himself for God. He uses the term existeni. And thus to love to, the love to which he was ecstatically drawn was itself divine desire. Although this metaphysical account of desire was not part of the original pneumatological intensification of the idea of Trinitarian incorporation, which I'm seeking to highlight, it was going to become a particularly significant additum for later exponents, and especially in the East. You're doing very well. I think no one's actively fallen asleep. So uh, are you still with me? Uh, right. Now, at this point in our story, because I've got you to the point which I have not covered in God's sexuality in the self. So this is the new stuff. Our story needs to divide East and West, if only to show ultimately that there were extraordinary and unexpected coincidences of expression in both strands of development, although certain variations within them. In the West, however, the minority report that I'm going to look at would become particularly associated with writers who stood on the monastic side of the increasing monastic scholastic divide of the high middle ages, this famous split where the monasteries became separate from the university seats of learning. And so this is going to be a monastic development. And this goes a long way to explain why it did not find its way into the most influential works of the university-based late medieval scholastics. There's only a sort of faint hint of this idea, I think, in Thomas Aquinas. We're not going to find it there. And if I'm not wrong, and this goes well beyond the scope of this immediate paper, but I'm aware of standing before some great Calvinist scholar, there is a certain further retrieval of this minority report in early Calvin, especially in his commentary on the Romans, on, on, on uh, chapter 8 of Romans, which I think is fascinating because... He also is in a hot spot at that time, right? This is, this is a way of thinking about the Trinity that's often socially located in times of intense strife and difficulty. If you want to see Todd Billings' book on that theme in um, uh, Calvin's early thinking about the Trinity, which is participative, um, I commend it to you. I learned about it from Todd because he was my doctoral student. Now, there are doubtless more examples than I could have chosen in the West than those I have opted to focus on here. I particularly wish I could have covered Bonaventure at some length. But the ones I'm going to choose are these. I'm going to look at the early Cistercian uh, writer, French writer, uh, Guillaume or William of saint terry and he's in the 12th century. The considerably later Flemish Augustinian canon Jan van Roosbroek in the 14th century, and then the Spanish Carmelites, Teresa of Avia and John of the Cross in the 16th century. And then I'm going to, at the end, compare these with strands in the Eastern monastic traditions that are presented in the Philokalia, which are the, is the monastic compendium um, of reflection. And it's not common for these writers to be compared 
So let me go to um, Guillaume, William of St. Terry first. I'm going to skip through these really fast, but I hope you'll get the main idea of what their radicality consists in and how it's reminiscent of those moments in late Nissen and late Augustine that I've highlighted. William of St. Terry's writings on the spirit and the Trinity, I think, can be read as an intensification and further theorization of that ecstatic vein of Augustine's Trinitarianism that we find at the end of Book 15 of the De Trinitate, already outlined. In this sense, you could say his emphases are typically Western, if only because his emphasis on the spirit as love and gift reminds us of the language of Augustine's purple passage and further expands on it. And yet, as I've discovered, fascinatingly, William might just as well be read also as the inheritor of Gregory of Nyssa's homilies on the Song of Songs, whose text he almost certainly did know in the Greek. In stanza 11 of his own exposition on the Song of Songs, he can therefore say, echoing Gregory on the same theme of his left hand is under my head and his right hand shall embrace me, which is Song 2.6, I quote, this embrace extends to man, but it surpasses man, for this embrace is the Holy Spirit. He is the communion, the charity, the friendship, the embrace of the Father and of the Son of God. And he himself is all things in the love of bridegroom and bride. And there he goes well beyond Augustine, because Augustine was actually quite squeamish about the Song of Songs. It was not for reasons that you can may imagine in relation to Augustine, his favorite text. William goes on speaking of full consummation in union. I quote, then I say it will be the full kiss and the full embrace, the power of which is the wisdom of God, its sweetness, the Holy Spirit, and its perfection, the full fruition of the divinity and God all in all, close quote. Likewise, in his text on contemplating God, William focuses intensely on the Romans 8 theme of incorporation into a divine adoption by the Spirit whilst drawing out his systematic conclusions in Augustinian vein. I quote, So then, love worthy Lord, you love yourself in yourself when the Holy Spirit, who is the love of the Father for the Son and of the Son for the Father, proceeds from the Father and the Son. And in his celebrated golden epistle, written for the monks of Mondieu, William painstakingly draws out the ascetic program of the sorting of desires which must accompany this longed-for perfection of man in this life. Again, it's pneumatology that is at the center of William's thinking, the Holy Spirit which, quote, infuses himself by way of love and gives life to everything, lending his assistance in prayer, in meditation, or in study to man's weakness. So... He is Augustinian in influence, but not in all detail. For William, the Holy Spirit is not merely love and gift, as in Augustine, but also love and knowledge. And the perfection of the human person to be hoped for in this life, again, unlike Augustine, who thinks that will only happen after death, is to be brought about specifically by the Holy Spirit and to involve participation in the very love and knowledge of the divine persons. In many ways, this extraordinary vision anticipates something of the achieved union in the later Carmelites in the 16th century. Now, jumping forward quickly to the 14th century, Roosbrook, in some contrast, is a sui generis thinker, deeply inflected by his own brand of Neoplatonic thinking. He is very much affected by Pseudo Dionysius and others in that tradition and in particular by his key notion of regeratio, the going out and flowing back, the flowing back of the divine persons into their shared unity. It is here that Roosbrook caused and causes nervousness in his orthodox critics, and as Rick van Neudenhover well shows in his fine study, steps over a line that would never have been contemplated by the great Thomas Aquinas, for whom the idea of regeratio could never apply to the realm of the imminent trinity, but only to the economic exitus and reditus, the going out of the, the Holy Trinity to, as it were, gather up um, people in grace, not sort of backing it up into the idea of the imminent trinity. But Roosbrook does make this daring move. Writing in the vernacular, 
and embroiled at times in endless disputes about heresy. One of Roosbrook's last great texts, which he calls the Book of the Twelve Begins, is amongst his most daring and revealing. Here he also systematically spells out the possibility of actual union with God in this life via incorporation in the spirit. I quote, Now therefore hear and understand to the good and inward man who entereth within himself free and empty of all earthly things, opening and uplifting his heart reverently toward the eternal goodness of God, there is thrown wide the heaven which was shut, and from the face of divine love there blazeth down a sudden light, as it were a lightning flash. And in that light, there speaketh the spirit of our Lord in this opened and loving heart, and saith, I am thine, and thou art mine. I dwell in thee, and thou dwellest in me. Now, where Roosbrook's account differs significantly from other writers on Trinitarian indwelling, however, is in the assertion that the end of this process is not simply an ecstasy of the self beyond ourselves into God via the spirit, a theme familiar from predecessors in this indwelling tradition, but a fruition of the Godhead itself, as he puts it, in a still and glorious and essential oneness beyond the differentiation of the persons, where he is neither an outpouring nor an indrawing of God, and at this point, you feel the persons have been lost. So the reason that I'm holding up Roosbrook as a sort of point of comparison here is that when this indwelling motif and this heightened pneumatology leads to the suggestion that there is an obliteration even of the distinction of the persons, we are, I think, in a heterodox world. And so this is not without orthodoxy dangers, this, this line of approach. So I think this example is particularly instructive. You can see why he wants to go there. He wants to say that the union is so intense that even within God there is no differentiation. Right, the contrast with the later 16th century Carmelite account of union in the Trinity is I think therefore particularly important because here we approach what is probably the most sublime Western accounts of achieved union in this life. For Teresa of Avia, who always loves to feign theological incompetence while being extremely astute, <laughs> insists that achieved union is itself a state in which one is introduced afresh and directly to the most blessed trinity, all three persons, but only by passing through what she calls an enkindling in the spirit. One realizes thus anew from inside, and now not merely intellectually, that all three persons are one substance and one power, and yet also and simultaneously still distinct. So she's careful where Rusbrook is not. Indeed, says Teresa, since the king is in his palace, that's Christ, Christ has taken up permanent residence in the deepest part of one's selfhood, and there is no longer any danger of doing anything other than is the will of God, despite the fact that as ever, this is what I love about Teresa in the seventh mansion, there's still a lot of annoying noise and tumult and contentious assaults going on, bangings and crashings in the kitchen, people being very annoying. Suffering does not go away, but it no longer seems to matter any more than do the ongoing attacks of your ecclesiastical enemies. When from the inside of the life of the Trinity, bear this in mind in future difficulties, one sees at last how to love, according to Jesus' own distinctive demand, one's own enemies. Isn't that lovely? You can only actually love your enemies, as Jesus required of us, once you're in union. The contrast with John of the Cross's account of achieved union and the living flame of love is somewhat striking. A much, a much younger, beloved colleague of hers who dies much more youthfully. For here we learn of no continuing tensions, no assaults of enemies, no crashes in the kitchen, but rather of a sublime ascent of the self into that very space between Father and Son in the Trinity, which is distinctively occupied by the Spirit. Now, he says, the soul breathes in that same Spirit between Father and Son. For the will of the two is one will, and thus God's operation and the soul's are one. There's a distinctive allusion to Romans 8 that comes here again. It's very interesting. He's absolutely clear 
that there's not a fusion, as it were, of the differentiation between the human and the divine. That's often the mistaken idea about mysticism. The absolute difference between the divine transcendence and us is maintained. But what he wants to say is that when we arrive at union in this life, what we realize is that we've been in union all along. Because as he puts it, otherwise we would disappear. God holds us in being. It just takes us most of our lives to find out that that's the case. That's the problem. But there is this wonderful heightened pneumatology, the living flame of love, at the end of his work here. Now, finally, ich komme zum Schluss, you're doing well. I want to ask, before I come to my conclusions, is there anything equivalent to all this, to this, what I see as a sort of Carmelite climax to this tradition in the 16th century? Um, is there anything equivalent in the Eastern monastic tra traditions that might have taken up Nissen's commentary on the song, Hint, and which also influenced Guillaume of saint -Terry? And the answer, it seems, is absolutely yes, although this is still underexplored. And it appears in the strand of tradition remarkably consonant in its emphases with this later Carmelite Western development. And yet the confluence is perhaps not altogether surprising, given that, again, what we find each time we find this pattern is a renewal of interest in prayer according to Romans 8, and an early therefore incorporative vision of contemplation that's engendered and taken forward. In God's sexuality in the self, I show how this was taken forward in Origen, in Antony the Great, and in Evagrius, and then into the later Dionysian metaphysics of desire, and these are all shared resources. But it's only recently that I have, through the recent work of Rowan Williams, my colleague, discovered that this is a vibrant theme in the Eastern monastic texts called the Philokalia, that great compendium of monastic wisdom only finally put together in the 18th century. But Rowan Williams has drawn attention to what he calls the pneumatological deflections of desire within God that he finds in the thought both of Maximus Confessor and then much later in uh, Gregory Palamas, not in their most famous texts, but in the ones that got put into the Philokalia. It's really interesting. And most striking here is the witness of Palamas, who, not many people knew this till recently, himself was influenced by Augustine, from importations of Augustine from the West. Although he's also following the earlier Maximus in, I I quote, speaking of the contemplative's prayer as distinctively characterized by desire, by eros. So this is an eros that's stirred up, that's stirred up by the spirit's outreach to the monk, taking the monk into a life of contemplation. Palamas then develops this idea with a certain intricacy and power in his text called Topics of Natural and Theological Power. And here is Williams' paraphrase, I quote, for the human subject to mirror the divine in contemplation is not simply for the human mind or logos to participate in the eternal logos, but for that human logos to be activated by eros, the dynamic of the Holy Spirit, in its unending urge to immerse itself in the foundational mystery of the logos itself, which images and participates in the eternal self-giving intelligence that is in the divine source, the Father. In other words, I quote again, the presence of the image of the Logos in us implies the image of the Trinity as a whole, with its own erotic mutuality, engendering a continual expansion and transformation of desire in the monastic contemplative, in the practices of so-called hesychastic prayer. This is, as Williams himself remarks, an extraordinary anticipation of, in the 14th century, and parallel to those deflections of Trinitarian desire in John of the Cross's view of the Trinity. Once again, in a model of Trinitarian thinking in which the prayer is transported into the primary eros of God by means of the Spirit's outreach. Much more work needs to be done on this theme in Palamas, as Williams himself underscores. 
For again, it comes in a treatise that is thought of more as monastic and spiritual rather than theological and speculative, yet it has not gained the attention it deserves. What then and finally are we now to make of these texts, both East and West, that I've gathered here for our perusal? Here are my systematic conclusions as briefly as I can. I've taken you on a tour of somewhat neglected and pneumatologically heightened emphases in Western and Eastern Trinitarianism in the substance of this lecture. They're not the usual texts you read in the textbooks about the Trinity, you would agree. And as I hope I've shown, what these texts have in common are the following. Three points. First, I trust you may have discerned in the material I've covered a possible alternative means of discussion of the place of the spirit in the Trinity from that merely of the Niceno-Constantinopolitan creed, one that might also go beyond the hardened polemicisms between East and West that have regrettably afflicted attempts at reconciliation after the various eruptions of the filioque dispute. The sui generis freedom of the voices I have discussed, both East and West, do at least suggest a point of radical rapprochement that might divert us from blockages created by the hardening between East and West that was made so very bad in the ninth century by the patriarch Photius when he insisted that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the, from the Father alone, thus cutting off completely the idea of a filioque. And they've also been hardened, I'm afraid, by 20th century Eastern Orthodox reassertions of the thoroughgoing symbolic betterness of the Eastern over the Western Trinitarianism in writers, celebrated writers like Losky and Sisoulas. As will now be clear, however, my goal has not been, like most ecumenists, to palliate those particular debates in their own terms, but to, as it were, turn the tables on them, go behind them, chasten them in the spirit, to discover that East and West, in their deepest respective contemplative assessments of the life of the Trinity, evidence certain significant parallel forms of thought which demand a kind of filioque. They are ecstatic deflections of divine desire within the Trinity, as Rowan Williams puts it, which then overflow by gift into human selfhood and establish finally that selfhood in God. Goes a long way to indicating how prayer and contemplation in the spirit may, after all, be the final place of the meeting of Eastern and Western minds about the nature of God, rather than their points of divergence. So that's my radical ecumenical proposal. We need to pray more and argue less. <laughs> Secondly, however, we still need to probe to the actual technical theological issue of how best to parse and express this technical matter of the imminent relations of the Trinity, and particularly the implication for the vexed issue of the procession of the Spirit, in the light of this material we've surveyed. And here I get really radical. We necessarily move, I think, to a position which is hinted at, but not completely clarified by all the authors we have surveyed. My suggestion here, which I already made right at the end of, the, of God's sexuality in the self, is, I think, better instantiated in substance by the witnesses of Gregory of Palamas in the East and John of the Cross, respectively, although I didn't cite them. In significant contrast with the instructively different solution of Roosbrook, whose end point in union seems to be the vision of the unification and loss of identity of the divine persons, this alternative insight that I suggest to you not only reads the Father and Son as intrinsically and eternally related in the Spirit, but as so related through the deflections of desire as to render the usual meaning of source or cause or foundation in the Father mysteriously transformed, away now from all false hierarchalism and remaining covert subordination of the Spirit. As I put it right at the end of God's sexuality in the self, it's actually page 333, I quote myself, we now not only need to speak thus of the Son eternally coming forth from the Father in or by the Spirit, rather than merely through or from the Spirit, an approach I shared with someone like Thomas Wynandy, but more daringly, 
we also need to speak of the father's eternal reception of his status as father as source from the other two persons, precisely via the spirit's reflexive propulsion and the son's creative effulgence, close quote. I remember writing those late at night, those words, and thinking, I wonder if I really know what that means. <laughs> I've now had to work it out. The father as source, I wrote in the last page of this book, has therefore here become ecstatic goal as much as ecstatic origin in the flow of divine love within the relational dynamics of the life of the Trinity. If you continue to use the traditional term source or cause, therefore, it's got to be in a very paradoxical and even kind of Pickwickian form. And it's surely part of that mysteriously apophatic revelation that I urged at the outset must characterize these authors' whole engagement with the Trinity in prayer. And then thirdly and finally, I come to us. I come to the lessons which seem to emerge from this investigation for issues of human eroticism and what we now call gender. As intimated at the outset, and as spelled out in more detail in God's Sexuality and the Self, I see in the project of Trinitarian reflection no mandate simply to read our preferred personal and political messages about gender onto the life of the Trinity. The Trinity is emphatically not our social or political program, as Miroslav Volf once put it, and people like Karen Kilby are uh, very much underscoring in searing apophatic critiques these days of once fashionable social Trinitarianism. But just as the material we have surveyed today does nonetheless strongly give authoritative credence via scriptural reflection, ascetic contemplation, critical discernment of tradition, and above all via the logic of the very homoousianism that propelled Orthodox Trinitarianism in the, in the first place to a vision of relations and processions as just suggested, so likewise I submit again in closing the insights about divine, trinitarian, purifying desire reaching out to us that we have found in these same sources presents a vision of human erotic selfhood mysteriously purged, transformed, and rendered labile to the ecstatic workings of the spirit through the long haul of the disciplines of prayer. And if the end point of such a journey is to become more truly oneself, whoever or whatever that is, than one has ever been before, as the Carmelites did so describe it, then this is perhaps a fit theological alternative to hold up as a desideratum in comparison to the cacophony of vying secular debates as to the contemporary performances of gender, which we're all stuck in at the moment as, as, a, as a point of um, political dispute. Finally, in other words, it is the indwelling trinity the Trinity disclosing the true nature of desire in the spirit that perfects our human selfhood in all its mystery. And that, I've tried to say tonight, is the union with God to which the spirit ever invites us. Thank you for your attention. You're reduced to ineffable mystery, that's good. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, as you know, we're living in a period when, for good-hearted ecumenical reasons, Anglicans in this area apparently don't say the filioque in the creed in some churches, is that right? To express um, solidarity with the Greeks. Um, and as you'll have gathered, I mean, I have sympathy about the point that the West should not have changed the creed without a council. But the propulsion of this way of thinking, I think, 
is to a necessary form of the filioque, but one you might say more radical than that even envisaged by those who want to resist it. <laughs> so, are you working on Maximus? Uh, no. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard Leo. Ah, right. Leo, yes. Oh, yeah, you did tell me last night, yes. Um, but I think looking at Maximus on this point would be really worthwhile. Mm. Yes, at the back. Hmm. In, in the, this well, the first thing to know is that it's impossible, and that's, that takes the pressure off, right? <laughs> I mean, I mentioned that, that um, strictly speaking, we don't do it, um, which means that if we feel incompetent, that's a real sign of authenticity and not a sign to stop. <laughs> Um, and I think encoded in the Lord's Prayer, which I didn't talk about, is not the opposite of what Paul says in Romans 8. It often sounds as though it might be, because Jesus gives us a, a whole lot of very obvious things to ask for, the things we really need. Um, and Paul just says we can't do it, so we have to groan. Um, but encoded in the Lord's Prayer, in the opening statements of the Lord's Prayer, are the, the handing over the handing over to the Father who is in heaven, whose name above all must be hallowed, and whose providential workings must be conformed to. All right. And then the asking for absolutely what we need. <laughs> so the key to prayer in its first moment is to open oneself in complete vulnerability to what can only be a gift of God's self to us in the Spirit. Um, and that's difficult because we like to be competent. We like to learn how to do things like making an omelette or riding a bicycle and get it sort of sorted. But prayer is a lifelong task of incompetence for the sake of God. And then we mustn't be ashamed to say exactly what we need. We say it to God. Whatever it is, whatever the deepest agony is, we just keep saying it. You want to come back? <laughs> yes. Contemplative. I've met a lot of folks in my congregation who are very contemplative of prayer and mm. receiving. So it's this not that I'm able to get into like these words when we pray, you know, so there's this tension. Part of what I hear is that, that I've often thought about prayer being a posture. Mm. A way of orienting ourselves to God. Yes. Yeah. Sure. I think the trouble is we, we live in this world of disjunctions where the people who want to be very competent, you know, take a, take a course in, in centering prayer and then they feel very competent for about two months, but after which they feel more terrified than they've ever felt in their life, which is really the authentic sign of it starting to work. So, you know, we appear to have this disjunction between beautiful, wordy, Cranmerian colleagues on the one hand, or complete silence, which seems poncy and self-important. But, I mean, anyone who keeps going with silence is obliterated, you know, in the Holy Spirit. And um, the, the great maxim, of course, is the, the one of the, the lovely Dom John Chapman, former abbot of Downside, pray as you can and not as you can't, but pray. So don't say, I haven't got time. What do you mean? Just cry out. Um, don't say it's too elitist. What do you mean? You don't need a book. You don't need, you know, you don't need eyesight. You, don't, you can do it when you're dying. You can do it when you're driving. You can do it when you're waiting in the bus stop. Um, but do it. Somehow we, we're, you know, as, as priests, we, we feel we have to give people permission to do it. But... Usually in our congregations, there are a little group of people who really are deep prayers, and they're usually the ones who are not making a fuss. 
<laughs> know what I mean. <laughs> Somebody over here. <laughs> mm. Yes, yeah, he's key. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I didn't quite know what to leave out. Yes, it would have been an even longer paper. I mean, what's wonderful about Bonaventure, he's a key part of the story here. And, and so are some of the Begins, like Hadovich. But Bonaventure is the great systematizer of... Dionysius, who brings together thought and feeling um, in a way that most others don't. They tend to fall on one side or the other. And so his, his idea of the indwelling motif, I think, is one of the greatest. Um, and, you know, lies behind people like Ruth Brooke. Uh, mm. Yes. Specifically with reference to spiritual Yes. And the old millenarian. Yeah. That's right. To that social context, yes. There's always the possibility of going off the rails whatever track you're on. But, you know, think of Luther and the Schwärmerei. I mean, you know, when, when the spirit gets disconnected from, um, you know, disconnected from thinking about the relationships, I think, in, in the Trinity, and becomes a kind of possession of those who want a fast road to... Um, unimpeachable authority. <laughs> that, that's the sort of sign of something going amiss. And I, I say that, of course, as an Anglican, I would say that. But, um, but I, that's not an anti-pneumatological position to call. In fact, my, my best friends these days are the more scholastic um, Pentecostals. Um, because I think they're the ones who, who never allow the spirit to be damped down. And so the question is always this, this balance, which is both a theological balance um, in the Trinitarian way and a kind of right balance between the intellectual and the affective. And that then tends to play out in a particular posture towards uh, church authority. So in God's sexuality in the self, I say quite impenitently, that the wing of the churches that I want to represent is a sort of ecclesiola in ecclesia, which is constantly um, slightly subversive of any, any settled authoritarianism um, and is trying to release people afresh into the life of the spirit. And I think these great monastic reforms try and do this. Um, I also think the early Calvin was trying to do it. Um, and uh, it can go wrong. Um, it can also, of course, be regarded instantly as very suspicious by, by the more authoritarian elements in the church, and that's the problem, yeah. What would you say about the Franciscans? I'm interested to know. Well, I think uh, the problem was their attempt to think that they had a handle on the spirit in a way to orchestrate a particular... Mm. Mm, yeah. Uh, and so there is a hubris, but often hubris and ecstasy are can not often hubris and ecstasy can can be closely related. Yep. Anybody who's been a pastor in the history of church knows how that. Stridency, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the rest of you aren't. Yeah. Mm. 
Yes. Now, you see, the danger is to say that that, that that the danger is to conclude from that that ecstasy is the problem. Whereas I would say it's not ecstasy that's the problem, it's the manipulation of it for certain uh, other self claiming purposes. So the discernment of spirits here is also, is always crucial. Things go wrong in monasteries, things go wrong in religious reforms. But then sometimes things go wrong, in, go right in religious reforms and the authorities can't bear it. And that's why they put John of the Cross in a dark laboratory for nine months and lock the door. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and a very place. Sure. And I'm intrigued that your focus on the imminent trinity seems to be a way of recovering the last 80s. In it, yes. Which yeah. is ironic. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure anyone's ever put it to me that way. Um, but I am indeed speaking to a secular world. I can only speak to the world I know, which as a Brit is a very highly secularized world. And I particularly care about young people, you know, people the, of the age of my own children who, um, who want to know why the, the, the um, institutional churches have become so deadly and poisonous um, and are looking for both intellectual excitement and spiritual verve. And so as I look at the history of the church, I say, what are the, what are the patternings, what are the places where, 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 where God comes alive for people, afresh? Always with danger, of course. But, you know, there's nothing interesting that doesn't have dangerous aspects. Um, and, and hence my focus, well, is, which is so important for me personally in my own life, on, on prayer, because... Our institutions are looking frail these days, and that's not a reason not to have institutions. Um, but they can only be enlivened if people sense that there is presence in those who lead them. And there's no shortcut. We panic and think that the answer is to send people off to business schools to learn how to produce better leaders who make money. But, and that's perhaps not a waste of time either, but wouldn't you agree that without the animating prayer, this isn't going anywhere. We all say we don't have time. But within the imminent frame, there's always time. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, because I see Pentecostalism as, you know, the great hope, really, for, for the churches worldwide. But as is happening now, as you know, um, Pentecostalism is, is developing its own, as it were, scholasticism. Um, so this book by Mick Habits that I've got on your list is a really interesting phenomenon of how third-order theology, you know, systematic theology that starts from pneumatology, can regenerate thinking about our... Uh, great inheritance in the Christian traditions. And if you wanted to, you could baptize this evening's lecture as precisely, you know, a third order Pentecostal lecture, if that's what you want to think of. It. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't accuse Pentecostals of being uninterested in prayer, right? <laughs> um, now, Pentecostalism, like charismatic phenomena, comes with certain dangers of... Um, excess and self-importance when wrongly managed, but I think we all know what it feels like when that's not the case. There's a gentleness, there's an openness in, of heart, there's um, um, you know, concern for the poor, and so on and so forth. These are all signs of things going well. So um, I think I'm a kind of undercover Pentecostal, really. <laughs> Rather a contemplative one, but, but slightly quiet. <laughs> But I am getting rather old. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if, as someone who lives in Brooklyn, if you have any thoughts on the Anglican tradition
Mm -hmm. Each member, how does that work out? Sure. Well, um, I'm actually rather a Cranmerian traditionalist myself, which might seem rather strange, but I think, because I think the, there is glorious Augustinian theology in Cranmer's collects, most of which he translated from the Serum, but he expands them in a wonderful way. Um, I'm not really in favor of obliterating his colleagues, but I think there would be a great, there'd be a, an argument for creative poetic writing of new colleagues, which many people have done, um, in ways that express this um, ecstatic dimension of the spirit, perhaps a little bit more clearly. Um, and in God's Sexuality and the Self, there is a long discussion about the matter which is just hitting, unfortunately, the general convention of the Episcopal Church, which you've probably heard about, which is the suggestion that their whole prayer book needs to be rewritten with um, obliterating fatherhood language. Um, I don't think the obliteration of fatherhood language is the issue. It's the question of how you understand it. All right. And this freeing up in the spirit to a project of the purificatory prayer in which you slay the idol of a false patriarchal fatherhood is what we have to get across. So again, the answer is more prayer. <laughs> um, creative new liturgical collects and even Eucharistic prayers, I think, can be had alongside our existing ones. I'm not in favor of obliterating the older ones myself. I th don't see why they shouldn't stand alongside. But we need good teaching on this. Um, and we need the prayer that has to go with it. That's my, that's my view. Does that satisfy you at all? You just don't know the answer. Yes. The most important thing in liturgy is to prepare for liturgy by prayer. Can I give you a suggestion? So, do you have, say, a dozen people, or it could be three, who would be willing to come and sit in the chancel with you already in your amis and pray silently for 20 minutes before your main Sunday service? Priest. Mm. Mm. Um, but, <laughs> but what I discovered is, is that I asked for daily prayer mm. in the office mm. because we weren't having it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Really know how to keep the day going. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Together as well, not just. Um, I mean, you, you, obviously, you can't Pelagianly manipulate these things, but I just want to to say that. If, if there is a possibility, whether it's in daily office for 10 minutes before you start daily office or for 20 minutes before you start your main service, with a few gathered together, you will find that that has an electrifying effect on the whole liturgy over time. I promise you. Um, and that, that you couldn't bring that about just by fiddling around with the liturgy, right? Yes. Uh, yes, you were referencing a fair number of the monastic uh, communities. Mm. And I wondered uh, in your work if you had a chance to look forward uh, because the monastic communities and the orders are all in transition now. Right? Absolutely. Mm. Uh, with the rise of the uh, third order. Yes, exactly. Mm. And also the new monastics will yep. be the new leaders and the new writers in the next decade. Sure. Mm -hmm. and the Middle East. And so, do you see some, what may be happening? 
Uh, well, we also have these forms of experimentation called new monasticism, of course, which don't relate to the older orders. Um, yeah, I see a great desire for... Um, I, I see a great desire in the churches for people to make demands on people. Uh, as, as, as we have secularized, we've assumed that we shouldn't ask anybody to do anything. Um, you know, that would put them off. But actually, young people want to have demands made on them. That's why they're seeking these new monastic um, forms. Um, we've lost our bottle about confirmation completely. But confirmation is a serious transitional rite, you know, equivalent to the bar mitzvah and the bath mitzvah. And I think the churches need to think very seriously about whether they shouldn't be talking more about rules of life. Um, and this is what I think people want. I mean, they can spit it out if they don't want it, but I think that what they don't want is pap. And that's why, um, I mean, the, 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 you know, the traditional orders are in trouble because no one will do celibacy anymore. But the third orders are growing because um, more general church people, lay, lay membership, do want structure. And funnily enough, they want the traditional orders to be there, <laughs> even though they don't want to do it themselves. So we're living in a very, tradition, very sort of a transitional and paradoxical condition. You're right that we're likely to be the next, you know, the next row of monastic saints are likely to be non-Western, I think, especially since they're facing martyrdom in so many parts of the world. Um, but it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time. And the virtue of theological hope is not to be underestimated. I think we spend too much time uh, beating our breasts and tearing our garments. Um, and there are just very small things we can do to enliven communities. I'm full of hope. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, even though we live in Vancouver, mm. which, is, which is very secular, mm. it's also a melting pot for a lot of new age. Mm -hmm. I know, yes. Yeah. And so um, as I hear you raising up the spirit, I hear a quietening of uh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. and I Yeah, very, very good question. It has two sides, really. One is, am I, by this elevation of the spirit, um, demoting Jesus? Um, and then the other is, how do we then relate to other religious and non-religious practices of silence and meditation? So, so, mm. No, I'm certainly not. Um, I'm actually wanting to say, but this was not this paper, that without this radical opening to the spirit, we can't appropriately speak about what I call the space of Jesus. All right. We tend to turn Jesus then into the pale Galilean, you know, the past figure to emulate, rather than the life into whom we step. Um, of course, had a historical life, and crucial was that. Um, so, no, far from demoting Jesus, I'm trying to ele elevate and expand what it means to think about Jesus and about the mystical body that we inhabit. As for sharing silence with people who don't share our Christian convictions, I think you have to trust the spirit on this one. Um, I ran, or rather the Holy Spirit ran, a silent prayer group at Harvard Divinity School, which is the most radically diverse place in the world, for 15 years. And it started with a group of rather more orthodox, well, about the three orthodox people at Harvard Divinity School that existed. So we sort of started the group. <laughs> and then it expanded, and it began to include a, a, a Jewish cantor who was there on secondment for a while, and various Hindus and Buddhists, and absolutely every type of Christian or seeker. And it had, 
I mean, it could have gone terribly wrong, but it, you know, because all prayer groups go wrong from time to time. Though they tend to go more wrong if there's talking, in my experience. Um, <laughs> and uh, this prayer group, in fact, that's why it had to be silent, because otherwise we would have had an argument. Um, but all I can say was, I don't think we should worry about that one. I think we should do it. <laughs> Strange things happen. <laughs> As Thomas Merton saw at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I came from a Pentecostal tradition. In yeah. Singapore, right? Uh, Is that right? Uh, Indonesia. Indonesia, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this uh, so called common accusation for, for the Pentecostals of being um, anti intellectual. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because of this impossibility problem, yes. Yes. And prayer, you know, So are you somehow expressing an unease about the consistency or the ability to bring together a prayer of unmastery with intellectualism? Are you saying that those two won't to go together? Well, you see, because I would say that if it goes well, then the prayer of unmastery expands your intellectual capacity rather than negating it. Not necessarily in the time of prayer, but because there is an expansion of consciousness and a pressure to integrate the affect and the mind, you could say that the prayer of unmastery leads to a kind of hyper-intellectualism, an expanded intellectualism. Someone like Origen will explicitly say that, by the way. Now, I know there are Pentecostals who are anti-intellectual. Um, but my experience of people who have been in the charismatic movement is that often they go through a very anti-intellectual phase at the beginning, and then there is a kind of um, pressure that comes about precisely through the spirit to the recovery of, of disciplines and the recovery of intellectual reflection. There are phases of life in Pentecostalism and charismatic. And if people are getting stuck in pure anti-intellectualism, I would say that there's something going wrong there, that it may be being manipulated by a leader in that direction, or there's a stuckness of some sort. So I don't see unmastery as anti-intellectual. Sorry, who else? I didn't hear. Evagris, sorry, yes, yeah. Since Lake of Stone, preparation for prayer 
Yes, well, perhaps it's difficult to make generalizations about Pentecostalism, um, and my experience has been somewhat varied. Um, you know, I, I don't like to box up particular movements in the church and declare them somehow anti-intellectual anti on the one hand or less spiritually mature on the other. But I think what we have to realize that all life in the spirit is a, an adventure in deepening maturity. And there are points at which we can get stuck or frightened or give up or mistakenly get on the wrong course, which is why we need others to help us. Um, and the traditions that are called the traditions of spiritual sense, which, by the way, are bemusingly different in different authors. There is no one spiritual sensation tradition. But in someone like Gregory of Nyssa, whom I have studied it in, in detail, um, instead of arguing, as Origen is more inclined to do, um, that spiritual sensation is a matter of disposing of the uh, physiological in order to arise to a level of direct spiritual insight, Nissen, in his later work, says that actually what the spiritual senses involve is an integration of the physical towards the life of the resurrected state, as it were. This anticipates people like um, uh, Evagrius and then later Maximus and Gregory, of, and, uh, Gregory Palamas. So that's the strand that I am interested in because I think in the life of prayer we are set on a course of internal integration into God and that must be physical as well as psychic. And that means that the way we use, is, use our senses the way we respond through the senses will, will change in our lifetime. Um, and that these senses can, in some sense, be trained by the spirit. Does that help at all? <laughs> Thank you very much. Sarah. Thank you.